schönen guten Abend wünsche ich euch allen hier in der Seabase und zu Hause an euren Endgeräten. Mein Name ist Geraldine und ich heiße euch ganz herzlich willkommen im Namen des Vereins Digitale Gesellschaft zu unserem 34. Netzpolitischen Abend und wie immer einen ganz herzlichen Dank an die Seabase, dass wir den hier veranstalten dürfen. Um, I think I'm going to continue in English because we have two speakers here tonight that are going to give their presentations in English. Um, so we have about a just under an hour program and hope you're going to stick around for a couple of drinks afterwards as well. As always, we're going to do some question and answers after each talk. And if you do not want to be seen giving your question, you can stand under that curve right there. And with that, I think I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Leonie Tanzer is going to talk to us uh, today about the research that she's doing and going to present to us a couple of the findings that she's had so far and is about to release. And her talk is titled Caution Hackers Ahead, the Securitization of Hacking and Hacktivism. She's currently a PhD candidate at the Queen's University in Belfast, and we're very happy she's here with us tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I was already introduced, my name is Leonie Tanzer. I am a PhD student at the Queen's University of Belfast and currently in Berlin at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And today I'd like to talk about like my first research results, which is uh, on uh, the topic of the secretization of hacking and hacktivism, which is a great pleasure to actually do it in a hackerspace, this talk. Um, uh, and I first like to talk about a bit about like the context of my research because uh, especially when uh, I'm doing that talk in an academic context, there's always the question what you're doing research on hacking. So uh, I always talk like uh, in that regard about the so-called criminalization of hacking basically. And what I'm very keen on is, bas uh, is to focus on hacking as a form of technique um, of uh, using um, the tools available and not just thinking of unauthorized access to system or data, as most people normally think of hacking, but also for, for instance, using technology for unorthodox means or developing free software. Um, so uh, that is basically the starting point of my research, whereby I would like somehow to distinguish myself with the other part of the literature in the academic research field, which is normally criminalizing hacking and seeing it as a criminal activity. Hacktivism, on the other hand, is a bit more uh, or tricky to de define, um, I see hacktivism as a form of uh, political activism where hacking is used for a political action. Um, and the important part is that there's values and ideology standing behind it. So if you hack your washing machine to uh, just make coffee, that's your, for your own purpose, that's what you do for yourself. However, if you, for instance, uh, do it together with others um, to make a statement against Siemens, I don't know, um, perhaps you want to spread a political message, then there could be the elements of hacktivism in it. What I'm very particularly keen on is uh, the idea that there are three dimensions to hacktivism and I do want to emphasize this is not very well developed at that stage. So if we have philosophers here and get the people normally get really crazy about my normative and non-normative definition here. Um, but what I mean with that is that hacktivism is again a technique. So it, yes, it could be legal, but it could also be illegal. It could be constructive or deconstructive, meaning that not every hack you can do uh, is necessarily contributing to uh, knowledge or contributing to uh, the uh, value of like spreading information, etc. but it could also be deconstructive. So some people would define DDoS attacks as a deconstructive form of hacktivism. And then the third part where I would like cont to contribute uh, into the research field is the idea of normative versus non-normative forms of hacktivism. Now, what I mean with that is simply a three-dimensional graph, which uh, would say you could do a legal hack, which is constructive and non-normative which for instance would be, uh, you could do um, a develop free software, um, so it's constructive because you're adding and not taking anything away, but it could be uh, for a non-normative, which what means for me like a personally perceived illegitimate, illegitimate reason, so to say um, for white supremacist reason. However, someone could do a DDoS attack, which was in the current legal system of the European Union and in Germany, would be illegal and deconstructive, but for, for my personal perce uh, perception, 
for a constructive and normative acceptable reason, which would be, for instance, in my case, for feminist reasons. So uh, it's, it's I, what I emphasize with this three-dimensional graph is that hacktivism is not automatically bad or good, but it often depends on like the context in which it is conducted and the self-perception of like the person who does it, but also the person who hears about it. Okay, so uh, this is like the idea of getting away with uh, the, the, the uh, negative perception around it. So, and I'm looking at the, a concept called secretization. And what that means is someone does not simply say security for nothing, okay? And uh, the idea is basically of the theory that uh, security is not an objective material circumstance. Something is not secure or insecure, um, but rather, in especially in political contexts, there's a security construction being made. So if politicians start talking about a security threat, they do it on a purpose. Perhaps it's, un uh, it's done um, not with uh, their consciousness being uh, like, in a, in a state where they really think, now I'm saying security purposely, but the idea is that when you talk in a political speech with uh, the word security, um, you achieve something. It's a social construction of something. So the idea of secretization theory is that in a research field, we're using that kind of theory to identify how and why the secretization process happens. So why do politicians do it and what happens out of it and what are the effects out of it? There are two different theoretical approaches. I don't want to bore you too much about it, but I'm somehow located between both of them um, and using both ideas that basically, uh, whereby both of them basically say there's a security construction going on. So, so the question is what makes a security issue? And especially in regard, for instance, to hacking, how has hacking become seen as a security issue? It has also been already been shown, for instance, on the topic of terrorism. So whenever a politician drops the word terrorism, they can legitimize to taking away political rights or digital or other rights, political rights of people because they can argue that this is now a, a significant threat for society and therefore we can allow everything. Um, and the other question is what does security, what does it, is it achieved if we make hacking or the internet a security issue? And there are three steps uh, the secretization theory would emphasize. First, there needs to be a secretization move. So there needs to be a stage where they start talking about security. So when do they start talking about hacking as becoming a security threat? There needs to be an audience, meaning not necessarily you guys, in case you would self-identify as hackers or hacktivists, but an audience, a public, which accepts that now suddenly we talk about like hacking being a security threat. And lastly, there needs to be policy. There needs to be legis legislation which criminalizes the activity, the term, etc. So, as I said already, it has been shown in regards to terrorism, but it has also been shown in regards to m immigration. So, people are no longer talking about immigration as a political issue, but as a security issue, because our society needs to be saved or sec ma made secure of those horrible immigrants, as they would argue. Um, so, my PhD research basically is split up into three parts. I first look at the secretization actors those who make the security issue. And in the topic of internet or in the topic of hacking and hacktivism, this is not purely politics, but it's also the industry. Because uh, people like, or in uh, sectors or companies like McAfee, Microsoft, etc., contribute to the discussion around security issues in that regard. So I look at both actors, policy level and tech uh, allies. The second study, and this is also an interesting one here, is where I talk with self-identified hackers and hacktivists on their perception of themselves, their activity, and the public discourse on that topic. And the last one is basically the secretizing our audience. So how is the public perception on the topic and what does that achieve? And today I'd like to talk about study one or some of the findings of study one where I'm looking at the policy actors in that regard. I'm focusing on the European Union due to multiple reasons. A, because current literature is full of US references and we mostly don't focus on what the European Union actually does in that regard. Uh, but however, um, it's very important that uh, there is bodies and strategies and policies being developed on the European Union level which affect people in the European Union and therefore I think it's important to also focus on them. And the other aspect is the current literature is very theoretically driven. I would even say hypothetical. Um, there's not a lot of empirical data being gathered. Instead, it's like often people waking up and writing papers. That's how I at least feel. Um, instead of like actually going into the field and doing research and gathering data and analyzing that. So this is my, um, at least I'd like to see my research in that regard, helping to shift the focus and uh, contribute empirical data. So what is the present study doing or what did I do? Um, it's a web-based policy document analysis of EU institutions. So I looked at nine European Union institutions, including um, the Commission, the European Parliament, 
um, ENISA, which is like the European uh, Security Agency, Europol, etc., um, and uh, did a systematic web search with controlled voca vocabulary. The, voca uh, the controlled vocabularies are different spellings of hacking, hacktivism, etc., um, and looked wherever this term was in a document, in a website, in a PDF, whatsoever, I would download it. Um, <laughs> And uh, I analyzed it with deductive, summative, qualitative content analysis, and quantitative. I don't want to bore you with the techniques, but it's basically qualitative and quantitative research. And it was supported by a software called MaxQDA because there were 621 documents, which is not that much, but still enough to keep you busy. Um, and uh, yeah, this was basically the method how I gathered the data. So I do want to emphasize here, this is work in progress. So uh, if you plan to cite me or whatever, please talk to me first, because I do still uh, like analyze the data, so I wouldn't necessarily say this is like full end results. So far, what seems evident is from 1984 up till 2014, however, caution with 2014, because I started with the analysis in November, so the year wasn't fully done at that stage. Um, and we see a, like a, a steady uh, development of like the popularity of the terms in documents. Interesting is 1984. Um, could anyone guess why 1984? What, did I hear something? Pardon? Apple Macintosh. I mean, I have no, I have no explanation purely on that, but there was the BTX hack. And as well, the incident in 1984 was actually referring to uh, teletext hacking, so I guess this would it. Um, yeah, so this is like the, 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 the documents. And what kind of documents are we talking about? There's more, but they don't all fit in here. Okay, so I clustered all documents. We have, for instance, the most popular ones are reports. Then we have, for instance, website content. What I mean with that is basically it's not a PDF, it's not a speech, a separate document. It's purely on the homepage, and I had to download the homepage site or that specific site, and uh, for instance, written question. And what I want to emphasize or want to focus on today is the written questions. So what are written questions? Written questions are um, like uh, questions from MAPs, so European parliamentarians, towards the commission. So they are keen, for instance, to uh, uh, ha like they, they perhaps uh, had like an issue in their constituency or in their, uh, in their country, and then they were interested in what the European Union currently does on that issue or just would like to be informed. So there are m multiple reasons why they ask those questions. They're not embedded or not evident from their questions, which is one of the reasons why I also would like to approach the MAPs who ask those questions for interviews to identify why they initially even talked about the issue. But, this is be but these are basically the questions I want to focus on today, and there are 47 of them. Um, we will talk about in the following pages on 60, because there were three questions which were, ta uh, which were stated by two MAPs together. So which MAPs uh, ask those questions? So what we see very evidently is there's, there is a difference between right and left wing parties. Um, so right wing parties tend to uh, ask questions more often on the issue of hacking and hacktivism. Um, what is uh, tricky here is that like, I don't know if you're familiar with the European Union, but European Union parties change names and MAPs change parties. So uh, it's not very helpful to focus purely on them um, because uh, uh, they might, the um, party which is might listed here has been later on be defined differently. So what I did, I was clustering all MAPs into different ideological groups, and I can honestly say I was very generous to some right-wing extra, um, sorry, uh, right-wing parties. Um, so um, I know it's always controversial to cluster, but I think this is the easiest way to basically deal with the with the topic. So what we see is conservative politicians are more often referring to hacking and hacktivism and the far right than the left and the liberals. Um, there's also an interest in like, uh, how often these questions are stated. We see a rise around um, 2001. Why? I guess, I mean, I have no evidence for that, but uh, it could be said that it comes from, um, perhaps, for instance, um, I personally was more thinking of the rise of terrorism, but okay. <laughs> Um, and interesting also 2013, anyone could guess why 2013? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> ISIS. ISIS, okay. Again, like this is purely hypothetical, so I really appreciate your thoughts on that, but I was more thinking that 
but Lalsec, okay, yeah, that could be true as well. I I have the hypothesis that it's because uh, the European Parliament got hacked, but uh, we, we we will know if I do the interviews. Okay, um, there's also an interesting part in like which which countries asked question. Now I'm currently studying in the United Kingdom. I was thinking that they would be a number one. Um, but interesting, it's Italy with 16 MEPs asking questions, um, and then Austria. Uh, I'm from Austria. Um, I was very surprised about that. I don't know why we have a certain interest in that topic. Um, and then the United Kingdom, Germany, and you can also see I clustered them which MEPs were in which like um, like ideological spectrum. So it also highlights that there are certain countries which have not like asked any questions on that topic so far. Um, so. I think a ra relatively interesting uh, question to identify why certain countries have more interest than others because uh, I would not see that Austria is more of a target than the United Kingdom necessarily, but I could be wrong. Perhaps you have thoughts on that in the question and answer session. So what are the results of this quantitative or more uh, statistical analysis? If I did the key free keyword frequency analysis, which means like every time this term hacking, hacktivism, etc., was evident, what did happen? So of course, there was varying provenance. Hacktivism was absolutely not important in those written questions. They were only twice mentioned, and they were twice mentioned by green MAPs. Um, and they were t asking about uh, the involvement of Europol um, in uh, Operation Payback. Um, and hacking is far more prominent. It's, as you would expect, constructed relatively negatively and seen as a threat. So there are words like infiltrated attacks, computerized crime connected to it. And uh, overall, this analysis basically shows that there's a shift of popularity over time and parties and across ideologies. Now, the other analysis is the conventional qualitative content analysis. So instead of focusing on keywords or on quantifying the information, I we're focusing on what does the term do in the context of the question. So uh, it's more um, a more explorative way of like looking at what uh, is in the text. So there are three ways the theory also uh, highlights it. One is the threat construction. So how uh, are MAPs constructing hacking or hacktivism as a threat? Which actions and actors are they attributing to um, like the action of hacking and hacktivism? And what are the referent objects? And with referent object is meant um, towards whom they hack or who do, do they hack or hack like um, so which are the assumed targets? Um, there are five factors I've identified in the, in the written questions, and one of them is personification. So why is personification important? Um, because the idea is um, that there were aspects in the written questions where they referred to, instead of saying hacking as an activity, they referred always to hackers. They made it personal. Um, they had like a reference object they could refer to instead of an action, which is very, um, there's no direct uh, line to it. Um, what is important here is that basically this, this enables a visual image. So we have that image of that like male ha hacker with a balaclava sitting in front of the computer. And that picture was actually very often evident. Um, so um, in a psychological domain, this basically helps a demonization because we know who's the enemy. Um, and uh, I think it's an interesting dynamic of how they basically refer to the hacker economy and the uh, um, individualization of that threat. The other aspect is the quantification and factuality of um, the question. So what I mean with that is the written questions are always full of like stats, uh, meaning they refer to that we see a 42% increase of hacking at, uh, or hacker activities, or uh, they refer to... Um, that in there were losses in 2001, over 90 million euros, etc. So they give like information, which helped them to make a very sophisticated claim, basically embedding their uh, their arguments in stats. And there's a really nice research done by a student PhD student in Qu Queens College, where she said this is the power of stats. So. Um, we acknowledge that there are errors in our numbers, but they're still so strong that we just ac accept if someone mentions stats, it must be true. Um, the other thing is growth. So from 1984 onwards, we constantly see a growth. No, I'm not ignorant and not saying that hacking or cracking or whatever you want to define it um, is, a f is a constant uh, problem. But we also always see in the questions that it's always about growth. We, we, we basically have uh, them panic around the issue 
and instead of talking about a critical engagement with the topic, we, we require an immediate response to that growth of hacking and hacktivism. Then the other aspect is the loss of control. So there are very interesting uh, like aspects, like given the danger of such activities, which represent a genuine threat to the right to privacy and confidentiality, blah, blah, blah. Um, and these aspects basically highlight that we, as the European Parliament, you have to imagine it's MAPs asking questions towards the Commission, are facing that like loss of control and we need to deal something. There's often a lot of like, um, yeah, I, to a certain extent, even uh, presidents or emergency in the way they phrase that question, which just highlights the secretization that we need to deal with it. We as the European Union have to combat these threats. And uh, this was ri literally a uh, 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 quotation. And security measures need to be implemented and we need to manage it basically. And lastly, there's an ordering. I've never, s like in the course of not just this study, but also doing my literature review, it's always the Russians and the Chinese who hack us. Um, and uh, I personally, um, this is not part of my research making a claim that it's the Russians or Chinese, I just want to emphasize what's in the literature. Um, but it's also interesting how the othering is happening, so it's the others hacking us. Um, and uh, what is also interesting is there was one incident where I found a document basically saying in um, a job description that someone who is applying should actually be able to hack. So it's basically this black and white thing of if you hack for us it's fine, but if you hack against us you're, you're in trouble. Um, so I think that that ordering is also helping to help that secretization because it makes the threat for the public something which is external to us. It's like the Chinese are hacking us, we need to do something. Okay, now I hope I didn't bore you to death, but you're more like, oh, please tell us more. Um, but because I always go over time, um, one aspect I do want to emphasize because I'm currently stuck with that um, is one finding, which is basically these uh, actions and actors and who they are attributed to. And as we probably could um, guess, it's the state, terrorism, crime, it's research, business, and activism. So these are the actors who conduct hacking or hacktivism. Now, the interesting one is crime is actually the most popular one, which is, was for me personally uh, a surprise. I would have seen them being more like focusing on terrorism because we always, always he hear that term, cyber terrorism. Um, and I, I do would hypothesize that in a, a US context, it might be more equalized with terrorism, but in the European Union context, the crime aspect was the most popular one when they referred to hacking and hacktivism. Um, so this is interesting. Why research and experts? Because there were questions uh, which highlighted that, for instance, the current legislations as it stands now criminalizes um, IT experts, for instance, if they intrude so uh, software like so-called white or ethical hackers. So what are they doing about that? And then the European Union or the Commission had to respond, no, it's all about like criminal intent, etc., and therefore they are out fine. And uh, what is still interesting is that there are dynamics in two ways. So. I don't know like, if you ever questioned that, but often it's, uh, it's if, for instance, US especially, but also the European Union, talks about like, um, Russian hackers, they have the idea that it's like the state hacking. And there's also like, these aspects in the documents where they talk about the Russian government hacking, but what is problematic is, can we be sure that it's like people being paid by Russia who hack, or is it like hacking for the state? I could hack for the Austrian government now if I wanted to, but I'm not paid by them. So what does that mean? Um, and so I think this is like currently something I'm, I'm very unsure about in the documents because we have both dynamics. Th they refer that it's the state who hack, but it could also be like um, hacking for the state independently. So here I'm not sure what to do currently at the moment because if I would look uh, purely at the state, it wouldn't grasp the full um, discourse, which is evident in the written questions, because some really refer to the state who hacks, and some acknowledge that it's perhaps someone hacking for the state. Yeah, and that uh, same with terrorism. Is it terrorists who suddenly start hacking, or is it hackers who suddenly decide, oh, I hack for terrorism? I, I mean, like, this, these are questions we need to ask, because I think they are also questions for uh, political debate in regard to how to deal with that issue. Who is the actor, and where does it start? Okay? So, what I'm planning for the future is basically um, 
to uh, finish up study one, hopefully soon, and investigate the tech-related documents. So in the course of my analysis uh, of those 621 documents, there was a bunch of documents coming from companies. So they were embedded on the home pages of ENISA, Europol, et cetera, which highlights that they have, for instance, been on a conference, been invited to a talk where they could basically influence the discourse, which help again shows how policy and tech industry are related here. And then the slides have been uploaded. And what is interesting is with the tech-related documents, other than the policy documents, they're full of pictures. Um, and I think it's very interesting to also focus on what pictures are used. As I already said, spoiler, um, it's normally males who sit in front of the computer with a balaclava. Um, so this would be interesting also to do a, big, uh, a graphical analysis of that. And the other aspect of study one would be interesting to talk about MAPs and the industry and basically identify what was the motivation for even asking that question. Was it perhaps that they were paid by someone or just woke up and read the news and thought like I have a question on that regard and then basically um, asked that question? So these are factors where I would be very interesting. Before I talk about study one, the study three is like basically public perception where we'd like to identify what is the current like perception in the so-called audience on hackers and hacktivists. And lastly, what I very much would emphasize is interviews with self-identified hackers and hacktivists. So um, I don't know if you've seen me running around in hacker spaces over the last two months already, um, but I'm currently conducting interviews with people who would use that term to describe themselves. And if you're willing and happy to talk to me, uh, I'd like to do an interview then, um, whereby I would talk about like, or ask questions around the issue of like, why do you define yourself a hacker? What is hacking for you? How do you perceive like the current political social climate, etc.? So this would be then the, 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 the counter discourse to the policy analysis and the public analysis, whereby at the end of my PhD, I would like to have like, basically three, uh, actually four if you take the industry separately, major chapters which highlight a different kind of discourse on that topic. Okay, so this is the participant information sheet. I have it with me if someone wants to read over it. I also have a PGP key where you can contact me um, in that regard as well. Um, and you might ask at the end of this presentation, so why is she doing it and what do we learn from it or why is it even relevant? Um, A, I think it's important to focus uh, on the current political and also academic climate. So what is going on on that topic? What does it achieve? And what does it make with the topic of hacking and hacktivism? There's also sociology of political uh, practices and techniques. So how do basically MAPs construct and ask questions uh, and for what purpose? To counterbalance the dominant research FOTC, so as I said, it's normally very US, fo uh, fo uh, very US dominated and I barely see uh, research on the European Union. The, there is a concept called desecuritize to basically put the topic out of this threatening security level into a more political sphere. And I'm not sure if that is very much uh, something valuable and helpful, but this is at least something which the theory would allow to. So making it less of like that heightened security issue, but more a, a, a topic where you can still discuss and debate about without being frightened. Um, and last, the last two points uh, are support the position and perception of hacking and hacktivism. I think in Germany, um, the term is not as securitized as it is currently in the UK um, uh, or in other parts of the world, but there's still a kind of like negative connotation and bitterness connected to the word or term. And therefore, I think it's important to basically counterbalance that kind of negative perception and put research forward which uh, shows that there's more to hacking and hacktivism than like this negative commentation. And lastly, um, I personally think it uh, could be seen as, especially like hacktivism, as a form of successful integration of citizens in the political discourse, as a form of political action which with a legitimate stand. Um, so I think these could be the rationales supporting this kind of research. Okay, and I end with uh, a very funny, well, I think it's more funny if I do that in an academic discourse because not everybody has seen that like picture already. But um, it's uh, basically saying hackers briefly took down the website of the CIA yesterday. Well, people here, someone ha hacked into the computers of the CIA. Well, computer experts or hackers would say someone tore down a poster hung by the CIA. Thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any questions you have.
Thank you so much, Leonie, for presenting your research here tonight and for ending with an XKCD comic. I'm sure there are questions. Thank you. My name is John Worth. I'm best known for a blog I write about the European Union, so I take this from the European Union side rather than from the hacking side. Um, you, you put up far-right Italian MEPs there. One of those far-right MEPs is Mario Borghezio, who's best known for thinking that there are aliens inhabiting the European Parliament, <laughs> and he asks questions about that. So I'd like to ask, how do you account for, or do you have a way and a means of accounting for essentially basic stupidity of individual MEPs? And does your research essentially treat every MEP equally, or do you actually find a way and a means of giving greater weight to ones which actually know what they're on about, as opposed to stupid ones like Mario Baghezio? Um No, like, I really treat them equally. Um, so uh, I think it would be, uh, I would get quite easily criticized for saying this one is more stupid than another one. Um, uh, so I think the only way to do research is like to treat them equally. Um, at least that is my stance. Um, I don't know if that really helps or answers your question. I, well, it uh, certainly answers, but it, yeah, but it doesn't really help your perspective, I guess. Thanks. So thanks a lot. I would actually love to know s um, a little bit about your personal motivation or what made you actually go that way because I think it matters yep. um, and secondly I would love to know how do you deal with as you said you're going to be may have qualitative interviews with people that call themselves hacktivists and I think it's obvious that they have a inherent need for anonymity so that poses some methodological um, yeah, obstacles maybe to you or challenges and I would love to know how you deal with those and third I'd love to know how is it embedded or to how do you embed it in the scientific landscape? So how are there, are you uh, all alone in the field or are there other people supporting you or is there a lot of skepticism in the academia? Okay, I hope I won't forget one. So the first one was basically um, why I did start with that research. Um, the I could go back to 2010 when I did like a data protection workshop in law um, and it just made me interested in the topic of privacy which made me interested in the pirate party and then I did research on the pirate party. After the pirate party I felt like to a certain extent interested in the topic of hacking and hacktivism due to that like experience with the pirate party. After that I I've always been interested in gender stereotypes, so I did research on hacktivism and gender stereotypes, and then I applied for this PhD, which had a very broad title, so nobody like came up and said, Leonie, do research on hacktivism. The title was Emerging Security Governance <laughs> in the Cyber Domain, Technology, Rights, and Politics in Practice. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's my research title, as all PhD titles look like, and then I basically applied for this, and then I, after three months, I came up and said, you know what, I would like to go on with the research I've already done in the past and stick with the topic of hacking and hacktivism. So it all started 2010 with a data protection uh, course with Professor Forger. So <laughs> that was it. Um, the second question was uh, 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 anonymity. Um, so uh, if I go back to, which one is that? No, th uh, there are too many computers here. <laughs> um, this sheet of paper. Um, I try to be as honest with my participants as possible. Um, so I have like an, a four-page sheet which explains, for instance, how I'm dealing with the data. So what I'm doing is uh, I audio tape the um, interviews with a dictaphone. It has a SD card in it. Perhaps I shouldn't talk that much information to whoever is listening to here. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I will use, for instance, tails to transcribe the interviews use coded identifiers and get rid of all the information which would make person people identifiable. And then I would uh, analyze them back on a Windows computer because all my software is there. Um, but I would transcribe the interviews and uh, have the audio files on the Tails um, operating system. And then I delete the SD and all the files. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does that answer that question? Yeah. It okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the third question was, how's your field reacting to it? Oh yeah. Um, so that I personally am more scared today than I'm in an academic setting. To be honest, I was thinking of like I get a few <laughs> iPhones thrown at me or whatever. Um, uh, it depends. So for instance, there's something called critical security studies. They're open. They think this is fantastic because they are critical. And then there's some 
old-fashioned kind of research which is somehow located in a, in a theoretical underpinning called realism, which think like we're still in the Cold War um, and uh, the US needs to basically dominate the world. Um, and they would be a bit skeptical because they think, oh, you're so cute, you're so idealist idealistic and uh, this is not value for our research field. So it really depends on the theoretical stance you're taking. So I would certainly say that like, the people I'm working with are critical security studies researchers who would say this is valuable research, which is important to basically counter the discourse. Whereas I would say old fashioned uh, realist research would basically say this is yeah nice, but not helping the further development of our research area. Thank you. One last question. Hi, my name is Maya, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm curious about whether you see a discursive um, trend or pattern from 1984 now to, I mean, has hacking slash hacktivism, and I also note there's a slippage in the terms, I mean, you're using both interchangeably, um, but when has it ever, when have these words ever been seen positively or negatively, and what's the trend um, like? That's a very good question, and I, uh, I think it's valuable to say that um, are you purely saying just because something is termed negatively or connotated negatively that it's securitized? And this is a question I am um, still working on. Um, but um, I wouldn't say that there was ever a stage where it was positively connotated. But what I do see the difference is like in the way ideological spectrums would talk about it. So as I said, um, uh, not every MAP automatically refers to hacking and hacktivism in the context of a criminal or terrorist or whatever context, but they certainly ask questions on other topics like on Anonymous, as I said, with the two green MAPs where they were more interested on what the Europol did and which data they've gathered than like the activities Anonymous did. Um, and uh, so it really depends rather, I, so far, I, what I can see, and I would say 57 questions are not that much to make a generalized claim, I'd be honest with you in that regard. Um, so therefore I'm waiting for the 621 other documents to analyze those. Um, but um, So I wouldn't say there's ever been a positive connotation of it, and I'm, I'm honestly unsure if there will, um, but at least I would hope that it's a critical like stance to it that you're not automatically demonizing, because the way they phrase it, it's really like often demonizing it. It's making it that huge or that criminalized threat that we n that we need to be scared of. That hope that answers that. Thank you very much, Lila. Let's have another round of applause. Thank you for being here tonight.